Be critical. Yeah. Uh, what's critical in design? Uh, can be social design. Uh, we are uh, industrial designers. Uh, we, we create products. I know that um, uh, uh, there is mass cons uh, overconsumption. I know there are many topics to uh, solve uh, within design. I think every designer has his own task and, uh, and uh, his own role. Our role is to create products because that's uh, where we're good at. at. But still, you can be critical, right? So um, this is uh, Forta di Marmi in Italy. It's one of the most spectacular places I have ever seen. It's like uh, what you see actually is that the removement of many years of blocks of marble. It's like a cathedral. The space is like uh, maybe four or five hundred meter high. If you stand there, you feel so uh, yeah, small as a human being. But what I realized then when I saw this is actually we already designed a product for them uh, a few years prior, is that this mountain will never come back. It's with another, other materials as well, oil or, uh, you know, or um, uh, uh, gold maybe or silver, but with marble is the same. So this mountain will in the end disappear. So I thought, oh, we need to do something with this idea, with this concept, because if you produce marble, you have a lot of rest material. As you can see, this big pile of stones, if I get my pointer there, then you see all these small pieces of marble, which just thrown away or uh, used as garden filling, or even for roads. And uh, we thought that was a shame, because now this marble get more and more precious. So what we designed, uh, this was our project we did prior, uh, uh, only possible with the latest techniques. There's a lot of innovation going on in the industry at this moment, not only in the marble industry, but in a lot of industries. Uh, CNC milling in marble suddenly opened the door for completely new projects. If you see now today's interior designs, you see a lot of marble. Why? Because you have now suddenly these new machines who can like robot mill, you can do very complex shapes. I think this country is a big um, uh, taker of marble. Of course, uh, mosques, uh, different uh, 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 clients, but uh, these machines, that's uh, the reason why mop marble is so popular. And then you can make these very complex shapes or with patterns which are milled in the marble, also a 3D. But still, uh, what to do with this rest? So we came up with the idea to glue everything together to uh, create new slabs. And uh, we uh, use a special uh, glue, which we can color. Uh, and we create like big slabs in different patterns, uh, which we called marble pattern series. Um, it's just launched in, uh, in uh, Verona, which is a big uh, fair for marble. And these are the uh, results. So everything is uh, sustainable. Also the, um, the, the glue we use. Uh, and, and I think it's a great project. I'm really proud of it because it's a new image. I mean, it's marble. It's still connecting to luxury, but it is not like your Prada or your Gucci or your uh, Chanel store. It's a different take on marble. And that's what I like about my own work, but also about design, that design can really go and bring a new collection uh, or a new approach to a very old um, industry. Yeah, I told you before, we are Dutch. Uh, the Netherlands, Holland, we have many, uh, many uh, names for it, but it's flat. So only mountains we have are made by uh, the animals. The rest is uh, as flat as it can be. Um, we were invited by Meharem to think about um, uh, textile related to the Dutch history. So we start like studying our famous painters, uh, and, and, you know, you see uh, a lot of textiles already in the days. So we came up with floral concepts and different uh, ideas on marble. We even looked at uh, quilted uh, skirts from, uh, dated from 1700. Look how beautiful that is. This is all uh, in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. But then our client said, um, yeah, this is also a beautiful uh, woven piece. So we had many ideas. But... Uh, we didn't know our own history so well, so the American client said to us, Maharam said, there's another thing which I want to show, and this is, it's called the darning samplers. 
And these are like studies made by a housewife back in <clears throat> 1750 by hand, just by sewing. And uh, uh, actually, it's, an, an, an it's not bigger than this. It's a study for, uh, to become a housewife and to know your tasks, to make your skirt, uh, if there was a tear, you can repair it, or uh, make the, the, the family, uh, sick, uh, how do you call it, the fa family logo in, um, in the textile or in skirts. But we were so um, uh, surprised by the almost like abstract contemporary approach that we uh, use this as an inspiration for a new textile. And uh, yeah, look, it's the same. You get like color combinations. And then we start making our own samples also by hand. So these are our samples, but as you can see, we are usually inspired by this old traditional uh, handcraft. But the basic idea is that we combine two colors and then actually we enlarge the textile a little bit because Textile is always about m several uh, yarns connected to each other. But uh, here we showed a little bit more. And then we create a very simplic, uh, simplistic design about color compositions. <clears throat> and um, So these are like also samples based on this idea. So this is how we work. We just can start with an image, with a sketch, with a reference, or with a question. We don't mind, actually. We like the restriction. The more the project is restricted, the better it is for us. Because uh, we have ideas enough, we have uh, opportunities enough, so if a client or someone says to us, okay, focus only on this, please, then we are very happy because then you know what to do. All uh, in-house made by a sewing machine and uh, days of work. Sometimes we think, why do we do it like this? It's so much work, so time-consuming. We are not very efficient, but in the end, we have also always good results, and I think that's what counts. But uh, please don't uh, calculate the hours which we spend, because then I think we, uh, we should stop. I'm running out of time, I see, and I'm still a few projects to do. So, um, everyone still there, uh, making some sense here, or, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> if you fall asleep, please let me know, eh? and then uh, I do something about it. Uh, upcycle is also, uh, that's uh, bullet number uh, five, six. Upcycle, uh, you can also say recycle, but we like upcycle a little bit more. Upcycle means that we do it in our own studio. We think companies should do it, and we should think uh, companies should work together to upcycle. So what's upcycle? We designed a chair for Moroso uh, a few years ago. No, not a few years ago, uh, uh, two years ago. And then we designed a strap. Very simple chair, but we focused on the strap. And uh, these are the colors. And Maharam the textile company saw this chair and they said, can we create a textile out of this strap construction? And then we start like creating, this is the sample, just made by paper, very simple. But uh, as you know, the strap is like a mask produced product. You can buy it everywhere, but you can design this strap. You can focus and then create our own color uh, combinations. So then we start, you know, then it's, uh, our work starts, it's like, that's what I'd like to point out. If you, your project is very minimal, you still can do a lot of research. So we do uh, all kinds of um, yeah, research on color straps, and then we make samples in paper, and this is the first weaving result. So what you see, it's still referring to this uh, uh, yeah, uh, st strap construction, but then woven in an... Um, in a uh, textile. Uh, this is how we presented the textile in a pavilion. It's not a floor textile, but uh, that's, we're so lucky with the Japanese because they take, out, uh, take off their shoes always. So we could present here the textile on the floor. <clears throat> but it looks like a tatami mat. And that's the reason why we present it like this. Yeah, this is um, stay persistent. This is, um, if you start working in Asia, you need to be uh, a little persistent. Uh, you, you are from, 
you're Asian yourself, but uh, we are from Europe, uh, and especially from Holland, we are quite direct. That's uh, maybe you have experienced that. I'm not proud of it, but it happens that we are too direct. So um, I learned a lot from uh, working with the Japanese to be a little bit less direct, but still. I think it's not for a reason that we uh, are direct and uh, you should stay a little bit uh, close to yourself. But once we start like working with Samsung, that's already four years ago. Yeah, four years ago we do uh, like different projects for them. We, our projects never saw production, only study projects. But this uh, project finally uh, saw production and it's also now for sale in the market. It's called the Frame TV, where we designed because a TV, what can you design about a TV, right? I mean, you cannot do a lot anymore. They are super thin. Uh, yeah, and uh, they, they show content. But we were able to, uh, this is the frame. Because we are colorists, we don't like a black surface in our interior. Imagine you have a cool interior and then you have this black two, two square meter surface. And if there are interior designers, you, you don't, design a two square meter surface in black in an interior. But the TV it is. So we can remove the frame and you can uh, attach a different frame. And uh, there's an art mode on the TV, which uh, is not like a screensaver. It's really like an, an art mode which uh, tones down and with sensors that measure the temperature, the color temperature of the room, and also the light intensity. So now here it's very dark, so the TV should go a little bit softer, and if it's very light, it should pump up more light. Um, I think it's really an innovation, and um, because it's very simple, uh, but still very effective. This is how it looks like in an interior. It's just like an artwork. So if you ask, uh, you don't have a television, you can still watch all, all these uh, channels and you can see everything, of course. But it is not a central point anymore in a living space. And I think that's the future of electronics. They get like a different position in interiors anyways. See, this is the same TV, different content and different frame. So we designed three frames and three uh, content styles, which you can download. Not only co our content, you can also download Saatchi Gallery content or uh, content from Inga Sempe or uh, other designers like the Burelec. It's a very nice project. So be proactive. Um, it's our f my final uh, project I want to discuss because uh, this is about our adventures in uh, Asia or maybe uh, mainly uh, Japan and um, Korea and hopefully from today also in Thailand. Uh, but, um, you know, if you go to, uh, to a company in Holland, you can just maybe send an email. Hey, guys, I like your uh, collection. Can we do a collaboration? And uh, well, then maybe you get a letter back. Oh, nice, uh, come for a conversation. In Japan, it doesn't work like that. You can send an email, but you can never reply. You need to be invited. Uh, maybe it's the same in Thailand, I'm not sure. But uh, in, in, uh, it works like that in uh, Japan. So we were invited in 2009 by Karimoku. This is their uh, factory. It's the largest manufacturer for wood uh, products wood furniture, and what I like so much is that it's wood furniture factory, but there's nothing on the floor like a wood chip or uh, dust or something else. So also typically Japanese is always very, very clean, very organized, and uh, yeah, that's uh, very nice. But they have one problem, because the old generation is not buying any new more products, and the new generation doesn't want to have the old products. I think that's an Asian problem anyway. So you see a lot of uh, people getting older, and the new generation, your generation, my generation, they don't want the old stuff anymore. So a lot of crafts are for that reason in difficult, great difficulty. Uh, maybe not now, but in 10 years they will. Because um, if you do glass blowing, lacquerware, uh, basket weaving, uh, wood uh, carving, whatever, um, 
there's almost no demand uh, for it anymore. Maybe collectors, because when did you bought your last crystal glass? Probably you went to the IKEA and, and buy your glasses over there or at the Muji or here at the uh, department store. Um, but this uh, Karimoku company had the same, they knew this problem. Karimoku is still doing very well, but they know eventually their company will be uh, uh, going uh, down because they don't have any clients, new clients. So we came up with a name, it's called Karimoku New Standard, a new standard for a new generation. So that means different designers, different approaches. So we were one of the first, and we came up with a collection based on rest, rest wood, so wood which Karimoku never would use, but Karimoku New Standard, different identity, could use the rest wood. And we did a sort of color wash to not cover, but to add an, uh, a layer of uh, a different attention uh, to uh, indicate that there is a rest wood color underneath. Arita, uh, his name is Momota Tuen, really nice guy. He saw this project and he said, wow, I'm in the same situation. I have this beautiful village, Arita, in the southwest of, in the tip of uh, uh, Japan. But I see my clients, you know, uh, moving. Uh, why? Because in the heydays, in the 80s in Tokyo, the, the hotels were filled with Arita porcelain, you know, beautiful plates. But um, Japan is now a little bit maybe out of a crisis, but they went in this crisis for many, many years, and the porcelain industry was going lower and lower. So we were invited, based on the Karimoko project, to think about a new solution or new opportunities for this industry. This industry was hand painting. A guy like this did two hours work on this beautiful painting. You can already calculate that this is an expensive piece, right? So collectors, people who embrace ceramics, a very, very small group. So we thought, okay, we don't do hand painting anymore. We skipped the hand painting at all, but we like the colors. So what we did is we make sort of abstract landscapes because all the paintings in Japan are landscapes, a rabbit with crosses or a beautiful scenery. And we distract all these colors and we create like a new color palette. Uh, so, this project is really successful in Japan because exporting from Japan is still very difficult, very expensive, but in Japan it's fairly priced. It's success because people recognize their own colors. So we use their DNA, but um, we use it differently. We just reorganize their color schemes, actually. So people feel really yeah, uh, comfortable with their colors, but uh, it's totally... Uh, reorganized. The project went to success, that was 2010 and uh, became very successful uh, in 2012. In 2014, uh, this, again this Momota son said, what you did for my company you should do for all the potteries because they are all in problem and it's like in a village with 150 potters, you know, one is specialized in ceramics and the other in glazing and the other in hand painting and, um, and so on. So we said, yeah, we cannot do that alone. I mean, uh, I don't want to uh, spend the rest of my life designing ceramics. So we invited 16 designers and 16 potteries, and we combined this together. So you see, what you see actually here is a pain, uh, beautiful picture of Scheldt and Abenes. We work a lot of, with these photographers. It could be uh, this old uh, globe, you know, two of these uh, round globes sh uh, moved in, in each other, or like a big table. Uh, it's up to you. And then you see all the designers we worked with. Uh, Vicky Somers, uh, this is our collection. Uh, Pauline Del Tour, uh, Stefan Dietz, where is he? Uh, oh, here, Stefan Dietz. Um, Teru, Yannick Hara, uh, all uh, designers who make their own interpretation on a specific technique. So we didn't want to end up with 16 T sets. So. Some were specialized in tea ceremony here, and others were make, uh, making coffee sets, which you can also put on the fire. So there's also a lot of innovation in this project. Totally different new take on Arita, 
Of course, you have people say, yeah, this is not Arita, this is uh, something else. But probably this will be the new Arita because um, the old Arita is uh, slowly going to die. See what you can do with color. And um, they also now produce the paper uh, table for hay. So paper porcelain. Because what happens if you bring up 16 designers to the industry, they, they look at all the opportunities and say, wow, this is amazing what you can do here. I have a client who cannot, who wants to do ceramics, but he cannot do it. Can I invite this client to you and make a match? And they say, yeah, that's possible. So they do OEM business too. And you saw, suddenly you see that this whole industry is getting alive again and, and, and people are like collaborating with other companies and opening up. There was even a tour, which is uh, something I really want to share because all these potters, they work for third or fourth generation living in this village and then we had to tour with all the designers in the potters and then the uh, the potters came to uh, each other's workshop and he said i live here now for 45 years 75 years i have never visited this workshop of my neighbor because you were not allowed to get in because otherwise you copy and they had to skip that nonsense i would say because uh uh, you should open up to start with new collaborations and so they did and now uh, every potter has his own uh, collaboration so we did this project with George Jensen also produced in Arita and now we started uh, with Maharam accessories making the same connections this is the reason why I'm not a lot in Asia Maharam accessory collections where we connect uh, textile designs together with Arita porcelain and again I want to make this connection because why finding a new uh, ceramic supplier if you already work for a, a ceramic company or why working with a wood company if you already know this wood company in Japan so we call it cross branding Maharm with Karimoku or Maharm with Arita and it helps each other to uh, give more value to the brand and I think it's very smart because otherwise you have to invent the whole wheel again so we did it uh, with Karimoku but also uh, with Arita this is the porcelain also on display at uh, open house in um, central embassy because I know this technique and this quality is matching the standard of uh, of uh, Maharm and then we did also connection with uh, Yoshida Porter, which is a Japanese uh, uh, bag brand where we combine textiles with existing bags. So I couldn't do all the topics, so I want to end. I need to end, I see already I'm 10 uh, minutes behind. Sorry for that, but uh, just by saying thank you very much for your uh, listening and your attention. Uh, hope you see you next time somewhere. So thank you, Mr. Schulten, for walking us through your wonderful creation. So now is a, a question and answer Come session. Uh, yeah, maybe in the middle. Nice yeah. okay. <laughs> um, anybody have a question for Mr. Schulten? Stefan Marokko. Ah, oh, Stefan. Okay, for Mr. Stefan. Stefan. Um, as you say before, how, how do you convince others and maybe your clients that your gut feeling ideas are great and really fit for them? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, really, I mean, uh, because that's uh, the most difficult part. Uh, it's getting easier because we have more proof that we did right in the past. But especially in the beginning, uh, it's, it's difficult to, uh, to um, explain, you know, what you're doing. So that's one of the reasons why we make the models. We do as much as possible our own homework. Because in the old days, a designer could just make a sketch on a uh, backside of a uh, cigar box and then give that to his uh, producer. This industry is gone. I mean, this, the designer is really going from sketch to prototype to even thinking along with the production and thinking of marketing uh, tools. So what we do to convince this producer is to do 
as much as possible what he doesn't have to do anymore. And it's, it's really time consuming. You, you really sometimes think, why am I doing this? This is the job of him or this guy or this company. But um, it helped us. And I think that's the reason why we have products in production anyway, because um, there's a moment when he almost has to do nothing anymore, just say yes or no. And then uh, he saw all the effort that we believe in the product. So probably, uh, you know, he got convinced by seeing us doing this extra work. So it doesn't have to be much, but I think the extra work is so important. You cannot expect a, a producer anymore to just look at your sketch and say, okay, man, we're going to produce this and we're going to invest like 100,000 in a tool or whatever. Uh, you need to convince him by yeah, showing that you're right, sort of. Very, very good. Thank you. Any more questions? I actually have one. Oh. So I was wondering what inspired you to focus on color? I th uh, that must be our travels. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. uh, if I'm here in uh, Thailand, it's, I, it was my first time and I, I'm, again, uh, if you in Japan, you have like, if you land in Japan, everything is like gray, gray, grayish. And if you uh, land in uh, Thailand, everything is very colorful, very uh, green, of course, you see everywhere green in between the buildings, uh, flowers, I saw a lot of flowers these days. I mean, uh, this is inspiring me a lot that uh, per country color is, and, and even per city color is totally different perceived. And that, because if you want to design a product which is there, out there for everyone, uh, it's very difficult to express in color because sometimes colors are not perceived uh, as here in Thailand or as in Japan or in Holland. Oh, so it's difference in the context. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. But I use that context because uh, you, you need to make it your own and then uh, give it back or something. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, because I've seen in your website that a lot of projects are involving, uh, involving using different colors. And then even though there's a project that is pure glasses, you still talk about how color reflects on different shapes and textile. Yeah. So I was wondering, like, um, why are you decided to specialize on color? Uh, I think uh, this, the blankets were the starting point, but mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know, I think every designer should create his own niche or his own uh, expertise. And um, <clears throat> it's like a doctor, you know, you do your four, four years uh, general uh, uh, doctor and then you do your specialism. And I think it's the same for us because color, it's not like applying color. Every technique has its own color range. So if you think about porcelain, it's, the colors are based on temperature. But if you, do, uh, if you think about colors and uh, spray paint, they are based on, um, on uh, chemical possibilities. Or if you think about weaving colors, they are based on like intertwining different colors. You get like color mixes. So it's endless. I can do this for years, only thinking about color and then the, the, the way it's perceived. It's very interesting. Yeah. Yes, um, I, I'd like to ask. Um, <laughs> Uh, what's the identity of uh, Dutch design and how can you distinguish the Dutch design from others? The identity of general of Dutch design? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, I, I think in, in Dutch design in general, let's speak in general, because there's also an exhibition on um, here and there, uh, at, uh, it's close by, I guess, uh, uh, behind the uh, cut uh, building, here and there, and that's a different Dutch design than I uh, do. So I think Dutch design is uh, in, uh, co uh, unconventional in, in general, also our work. It's about uh, innovation and it's, I think, with a twist of humor. And that's sort of the base uh, starting point. But, you know, in the hey heydays of Dutch design was uh, really popular in, uh, in Milan at the Salona or, uh, but, um, uh, I think mainly because of the uh, Design Academy. Uh, that was, I think, the, the most important reason why Dutch design is so well known, uh, because it was powered by the government with, uh, with money. Students or uh, graduates could like experiment for one year or six months 
paid by the government to study a, a certain topic. And that helped a lot. I think, uh, you know, I need to thank my own government that we were able to do that <laughs> because now it's like shrinked a little bit. You know, the money was gone in the crisis and now, you know, we start again. Uh, but like all art forms, also design was subsidized. Design Academy and then our, I think, just very direct approach, which is typically Dutch, of course, but you see back in design as well. But it's very general, eh? don't... Uh, write a book about it because then uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I also agree that it's, it's mixed with a little bit of sense of humor I think like so yeah 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 yeah. it's always the case which I like yeah. anyone maybe we take the last question oh maybe two last because we oh, have why not? I'm a lot of people interesting in now uh, asking questions yeah, I, I don't mind <laughs> I'm, I was late sorry for that hi thank you for your lecture so I was interested in the way that you talk about Guy Becker that in the in the past that you asked for, for the SYs. Like, so my question is about how do you see the young generation of Dutch design? Like, how the emerging designer coming, because we can see now like in, in Milan or in the design magazine, there's a lot of diverse of how the design, the Dutch design approach. Yeah, <clears throat> I think uh, the, mo the period that we, you had droog design, and then we start like introducing it, it when Lee Edelkort, this his trend forecast, became director of the Design Academy. She had like a vision how to run this Design Academy, but she started also to push several designers, Marta Baas, uh, Studio Europe. A few of these names were like pushed as star designers. That's gone. I, I, I don't think there are any star designers left. I mean, it's not an interest, let, let's so to speak. The new generation I know, they share, they like team up, they do collective uh, presentations, they create materials. Sometimes they're not even interested in the end result, only in the material. So for instance, Envisions, maybe you know this uh, research uh, collective, they only uh, research materials. And then sometimes I have a conversation with them and they said, you don't want to make a product out of it because I'm a product guy. And I said, no, it's not our interest. <laughs> it's just, um, it's a very beautiful recyclable material, but I don't know what to do with it. I leave it to someone else. Mm -hmm. 3D printing, which was already there, but now with uh, sustainable uh, prints, you see a lot. And then designers start reproducing their own furniture. So instead of going to a producer, they, they think, yeah, I start for myself. So you have a lot of self-producing designers, which is interesting because we did that already in Holland. And, um, and color, you see a lot. I mean, uh, really a lot. So I think you, 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 especially this year, Salona, you will see a lot of, I don't know, material samples with bright colors, a lot of materials and so. How do you see the, for the uh, Thai, uh, Thailand uh, designers the future? What, you, what do you think? Uh, oh. okay. <laughs> I think maybe we need another conference. No, but sure. <laughs> I, I want to. Uh, hi. So, yeah. Keep it, keep it short. Huh? <laughs> keep it short, right? So, for me, like, like you say, Envision, I'm also a fan of them. Also, yours, your work. In Thai, for me, I think is a bit struggle right now because we get less of collaboration in my view because compared to the Dutch design, you're kind of like connecting people, matching together and kind of pushing the boundaries of the work to become better and better. But for me, I found it can be better in Thai design because we get more like design week, we get more like a platform to showcase the young generations. So I think it's, it's upcoming right now. And I really appreciate that you asked this one. <laughs> but uh, collaborations are easy. Yeah? You just yeah. have to uh, sign in and uh, make a group. And uh, yeah. it's very co I think a lot of designers don't collaborate because they are afraid that uh, someone will steal their design. Mm -hmm. In the end, it's never like that. Because you can, with even if I would, ask this group uh, design a chair, you get like a hundred chairs, different chairs, never the same. So I think this being afraid for being copied or being uh, sharing your ideas is totally nonsense right. because 
the whole process to get this product in production is like another two years. So it's not like, okay, uh, this is the design and then uh, it's in production. Yeah. So if you forget the copy-paste story and just uh, want to share, it, it, it really uh, speeds up your uh, uh, success. success and also uh, knowledge, you know? You mean, uh, why going to a client? If you do it for uh, $100 and your neighbor is doing it for 50 then there's something wrong, right? So you need to team up and say, okay, for, let's agree on what what's the minimum price is because the industry is also very uh, uh, smart sometimes. They, if you, you know, they try and, and, and get the best deal out of it. And if you collaborate, you can sort of, yeah, uh, make a stop to uh, not be, but you, you need some income, right? So uh, also one other reason to collaborate. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, last question. Oh, okay. So I saw your book, um, the reproducing Cholsons and buying. Can you tell the audience a bit about the book? <clears throat> yeah, the the book uh, is made with help from uh, Michael Maherm, who was uh, founder of Maherm. Not founder. His father was the founder, but he, he made it a design company. And uh, <clears throat> it's not a coffee table book, so you don't find the last projects. It's just a book about our the way we work, every sample, every. <laughs> Uh, color every sketch is re-photographed and reproduced over seven projects. So it tells you uh, how we think, how we work. It's uh, written by uh, Louise Schauenberg, who did also the book for Helen Jongerius and uh, the Boerleg. So I think uh, it's a great book. Okay. So for those, uh, for those of you who are interested, can drop by. There's a copy, some of them, and I heard that there's a special price for today if you're interested. Okay. <laughs> and then also some samples of his work for the fabrics and then a free postcard with color, like different colors. Okay. Okay, so um, how about a round of applause for Mr. Stefan Cholten? Thank very, you. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Very interesting.